the crossroads of the Ozarks. It's the Gilbert House Fellowship Bible Study for Sunday, February 26th, 2023. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and how can it possibly be 226? When did that happen? It snuck up on us <gasps> on little cat feet. Dee, little dee, 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 dee. <laughs> Just like fog. <laughs> but it also means that in just about 15 days or so, you and I are going to be packing for Israel. Yes, yes. We're going early in case you're going with us. You're thinking, hold on. We thought we're, it started going, on the night. Yeah. It, yeah, we're going early. Right. We're going to do some video and turn that, we, we pray, into a cohesive um, video presentation. I, I hesitate to call it a documentary, but it because that's just not our style, but it'll it'll be something We're like that. Vo- borrow the term travel argumentary. Travel argumentary. Really, like it's yes. just the two of us blathering about what we did and then showing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the the visual part that's so impactful. But we're getting to spend a day with an archaeologist who perhaps two, perhaps two who have um, done some really excellent work on some of the megalithic sites in northern Israel, and we'll connect that all together as to why that's relevant. And actually, kind of connected to our study today. It is indeed. Imagine oh, yeah. that. Boy, the Lord, I'll tell you what, it's great. We uh, want to remind you that toward the end of the study today, we will be discussing Build a Barn Better. If you are unfamiliar with that concept, <laughs> it's our project for the Lord. We want to dedicate our 30 by 40 metal barn to his ministry. Right. And he for eight years, he's said, no, not yet. Well, finally, he said, okay. Yeah. And it's clear to us that it is indeed his timing because many of you have given sacrificially towards that project. And by that, by that I mean funds that perhaps you might have used for your own self. Yes. And that includes anybody who gives a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever it is. A, a larger amount. Some mm-hmm. have given some pretty hefty amounts, and we would have no opportunity to to uh, fulfill this project for the Lord if it weren't for you. Yes, and if, if the if the phrase "build barn better" sounds familiar, we'll explain how we're just repurposing something that's been put out there uh, by globalists for uh, for God's use. Yeah, uh, we we. we we, we reversed it humor. the way the Lord reverses so many things. Right. Well, we just have an odd sense of humor. So. Well, we do. Anyway, okay. we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Also, an announcement about the Israel tour. If you are joining us, um, well, uh, we'll go ahead and just let you know about this up front. We just received a phone call just prior to recording this morning from Rabbi Zev Porat, a Messianic rabbi, good friend of ours, Re- Zev and Lynn. We've come to know them over the last, uh, oh gosh, six years. Yeah. And, Wonderful um, man of God. Yes, and uh, they joined us on our tour in 2019, so we asked Zev and Lynn if they would uh, accompany us again this year. But this morning, Zev called and said there's been an emergency with uh, one of his co-workers in ministry in uh, Israel. And mm-hmm. so Zev is being called upon to step up and uh, cover for this gentleman during yeah. the time that the tour will be taking place. So Zev, will, Zev and Lynn will not be able to join us. No, sadly they won't, and we're going to miss that terribly. Yeah. Um, but if you love Zev and Lynn, if you love Zev Poretz, viewpoint and you love Carl Gallup's yes the two of those men they're both going to be there Lynn will probably be with them and maybe Pam I don't know Mm -hmm. Carl's wife but they are going to be at Morningside in Blue Eye Missouri at the Jim Baker show on April the 11th is that it um we're going to be there on April the 11th okay then it's the following week yes they will be there April 20th okay so we'll, we'll talk well, about that Well, that's an again. interesting day for them to be there. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? Hitler's birthday. <laughs> Let's talk about why Hitler is, was wrong. Yes. They, uh, so after the tour is over, Zev will be coming over here to the States, which is something that's been planned for quite some time. He and Carl often travel together. They, they've become best friends over the years. And uh, so we're going to go down to Morningside ourselves that week, but we will be there on the 11th. We'll tell you about that again toward the, uh, the end of the study. But uh, We get to be on the panel on the 11th yeah oh, imagine yeah. that well we'll get to share what we had just done in israel exactly but we'll also be talking about build back better because the uh, the focus of our visit will be the world economic forum's great reset initiative yes which they've now rebranded because we figured it out uh, yeah we can <laughs> we tried what telling we everyone it was it a now yeah the great narrative that's it that's what they're calling yeah it now. well so they'll anyway. soon call it something else as soon as we all figure it out mm-hmm We'll put that uh, in the right-hand column at our website, gilberthouse.org. And it's also on our app. If you haven't downloaded our app yet, please, it is free 
available for multiple platforms, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire. You can also get the video-only portions of it for Roku and Apple TV. But when you've got it on your mobile device, a calendar of upcoming events, including where we'll be as uh, we start getting deeper into the year, there'll be more conferences coming up, I'm sure. Uh, We've got one in July. Those will all be there, plus a a schedule of our upcoming Bible studies. So that's all on the app. Well, I just noticed something I spy with my little eye. Yes. A red sweatshirt Uh that says bulls on it. Now, that's right. How funny that is. And you'll find out once we dig into this morning's Psalms. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Here's a Chicago Bulls sweatshirt, but it's still funny. Flea market find cost us three bucks, but Uh, I I like it. And uh, being from Chicago. Absolutely. During the Jordan era, you know, I was, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun. But we'll, we'll explain why that is relevant and the whole connection between our Israel tour, why we're going early in this morning's studies, all will be made clear. Connection with the Chicago Bulls? The Bulls. <laughs> because a fan of the Chicago Bulls is going, plus it's not. So <laughs> hang on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together over your word. Thank you for the joy in our hearts that we can feel even in the midst of a rising darkness around the world. We see so many things, the, uh, the tragedy that's taken place in Turkey and Syria, the ongoing conflict in Yemen and Ukraine, conflicts rather, plural, and um, just the work of the enemy evident on our streets. We see the tragic stories about this new zombie drug that is afflicting so many young people whose lives are, are being wasted away in the grip of this, this powerful narcotic. Lord, we pray for your spirit to bring revival. We look at uh, what has happened at Asbury University, at uh, other universities and colleges around the country, and we pray for your spirit to be in this, Lord, that your word would be preached because we know however and whenever your word goes out, it does not come back empty. So, Lord, we ask for your spirit to move in these days to show us your glory. Lord, we we see in the Psalms that we've been reading times when David was just in despair and yet, like Job, continued to hold faith in you, knowing that you are there even as we go through, as we will study today, the valley of deep darkness or the valley of the shadow of death. So, Father, we pray as we study today, encourage us, lift us up, grant us wisdom that we would understand your word to the best of our ability. And then as we go forward from here, that we share the hope that we have in you with those around us, family, friends, colleagues, co-workers. Lord, be with us. Grant us clarity of thought and word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, speaking of colleagues and co-workers, if... Um, you do not follow us on Facebook or you haven't listened to yesterday's PID radio special, you may not be aware that Dr. Michael S. Heiser went home to be with the Lord mm. this past Monday. Yeah. Age of 60, he succumbed after 18 months, uh, a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, mm-hmm. which often is much quicker than that. And um, Mike worked right up until the middle of January. You can find new episodes of his uh, Naked Bible podcast until like the third week of January. He continued to work and teach through the Awakening School of Theology that he founded there in uh, Jacksonville in partnership with Celebration Church. Um, Mike is uh, missed. We pray for his wife, Trina, their four children, and um, certainly all the friends of Mike Heiser and mm-hmm. all those whose lives have been touched and changed as ours have been. I, Absolutely. I, it's not overstating it to say that Mike's work literally changed the course of our lives. And I think his work has literally changed the course of perhaps millions of people's of life. Yes. Because his, his books have been translated into a lot of languages mm-hmm. worldwide. And part of that uh, process goes through Miklot. Right. Miklot is his 501c3 that he and Drina established uh, a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you are so led to uh, help donate to that, that is a 501c3. So you can deduct that if it's important to you. Uh, we, however, Derek and I are not a 501c3. We're mm-hmm. just a couple of schlubs. Yes. <laughs> We're not official. We're paying We're, taxes on it and we just do. avoiding the oversight our, of the IRS. Our yes. accountant is uh, is very careful about making sure we pay on every every dime we get. And we're very careful about making sure she's aware of it. Um, 
I guess that's it. We mm-hmm. we miss Mike terribly, but we rejoice with his graduation to glory. Yes. He sees now clearly yes. what he's been teaching about for years, the divine counsel. And hearing that... Uh, <sighs> I am sure he's heard that. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I am sure he's heard that. Hebrews 2, and in fact, we will come to uh, one of these verses today, which is quoted in Hebrews 2. I will sing of your name to my brothers. Yes. Sing, yeah. So Mike is now part of the Divine Assembly, and we look forward to uh, look forward to that reunion. Yeah, where he says, "Okay, uh, I got to correct a few things." <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus but comes sure. over and says, "Wait a minute! Not yeah. everybody got everything right. In yeah. fact, nobody got everything right. So mm-hmm. let's have class." <laughs> what a joy that will be! We pray that uh, we get to work alongside Mike in the Divine. I archives. Yes, won't that be amazing? Yes. Well, speaking of the Lord uh, teaching us, Psalm mm. 22 is all about his suffering. The Psalms that we have today, these, I, I know we, we're going through the Bible in chronological order, the order in which the events took place. And these four, 22, 23, 47, and 68, were part of whoever made up that schedule last week's, and we already had like four other Psalms in there. It's like, Wait a minute, there is no way we're going to get all of it. We may not even get all through through all four today. I, yeah, I agree with deep. you. They're, they're very, very rich. Yeah. 22nd Psalm. To the choir master, according to the Doe of the Dawn, very possibly the name of the tune to which this psalm was originally sung, a psalm of David. In the Septuagint, it is titled the Psalm of the Cross. Oh. Which, of course, this is what happens on the cross. Uh-huh. For the end, concerning the morning aid, a psalm of David. Huh. I would think the psalm of the cross, that was a title that was added later. Because oh, I, oh, I'm I, sure I looked it this is. up, and I'll explain why I say that here in just a moment, because it's clear the 22nd psalm is a messianic prophecy. Mm-hmm. But the Jews would not have put that in there. Now, right. it's possible that the Greek translators did, and it's, it's hard to say what the personal beliefs of those Greek translators from Hebrew into Greek mm-hmm. did. They may have, some of them may have been Essenes. It's possible, but I think it's more likely that that was added by whoever translated it from the Greek into English. Oh, yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I agree, but it is obviously it's a not, Psalm of the Cross. Yes, it is, obviously. But yeah, Jews wouldn't and, have done that. And the <laughs> reason this is phenomenal is, well, we'll get to this in a minute, but it's it's clearly prophetic because mm-hmm. they, there was no such thing as a cross in the time of David. No, yeah. and the idea that the Messiah would suffer and die right, right. was not a common uh, belief. It was not a belief at all. It was with the Essenes. The Essenes, yes. The Northern Essenes. That's why I'm saying, what if some of those Northern Essenes were part of the, were part of the Septuagint the team at Alexandria. Yes. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Psalm 22, verse 1. This line will sound familiar to you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quoted that on the Mm -hmm. cross. You find that in uh, Matthew 27, verse 46, Mark 15, verse 34. So since Jesus quoted this, maybe we should pay attention to the rest of this. We should. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Hmm. The, The Septuagint says... The account of my transgressions is far from my salvation. Hmm. Now, this was written by David. Mm -hmm. So David feels his transgressions is far from my Yeshua, Hmm. would be my guess. Well, let's see. Since I don't have the original text that was translated. You are correct. Salvation, saving, yes, that, that is the word Yeshua. Why are you so far from Yeshua? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> I know. Underline that. Oh. Yeah. I, I am highlighting that right now for future reference. Why are you so far from Yeshua from the words of my groaning? Mm-hmm. Pow. Boom. Verse 2, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet, mm-hmm. yet you are holy. Oh, and you've, t- you've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. Enthroned on the praises of Israel. Yes. 
our Lord actually sits upon our praises. He inhabits our praises. Um, this says, the praise of Israel dwellest in a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. We are in a holy place. Yeah. When we pray and praise, our words go into a holy place. The ESV translators add as an alternate rendering of that verse, yet you are holy dwelling in the praises of Israel. Mm -hmm. Wow. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. What is the word for rescued? Uh, Nimlatu. Mm. Uh, and that's a, that's a really bad pronunciation, but that's what it yeah. looks like. Again, it was not salvation. No, but, but, but the word in the Septuagint is, right. and we're saved. And, and if you're looking for ways that you can search the interlinear text for the Hebrew words, I've got, um, Logos Bible software, which, uh, do that at Blue Letter. but you can do that at Blue Letter Bible, mm -hmm. Blue Letter Bible dot com. I do that all the time. org and they will. Uh, yeah, you can you can see the Hebrew words there. Yeah. I go for the reverse interlinear right. interlinear and that will give me the the tense and mood of the of the verb. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a better indication because depending upon the mood and the tense, it can change the meaning slightly. Right. Uh, verse 5, again, to you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. That's Isaiah. Huh. I don't know if it's a direct quote, but uh, Isaiah, was it 53? That talks about he's a reproach and... and yeah, it's, it's that same sort of messianic... Yeah. Um, not exact uh, wording, but it's that idea. The suffering servant. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and this is where we get into the really the prophetic segment, uh, mm -hmm. which again is highlighted by the fact that Jesus quoted this on the cross. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. And the Hebrew sense there is they, they let out their lips, mm -hmm. possibly meaning that they're saying things that they would normally not say. Yeah. Blaspheming. Crowd dynamics yeah. take over and everybody's oh, my like, goodness. mock the guy on the cross. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in Yahweh. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And that was done. That, that happened. happened on the cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's crying out to God. Let's see if God saves him. Mm -hmm. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, and there is none to help. Is what is trouble? Is that is that the idea of just how we understand trouble, or is that an entity? Um, I don't think so. It's uh, su it's sarah, mm. need, distress, anxiety, enmity. Okay. Um, I'd have to look that up, but I don't think it's in the DDD. It sounds like the kind of thing that you would find there, mm -hmm. though. Yeah. Now we get into the superna mm -hmm. really supernatural section. Verse 12 of Psalm 22. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. No. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Okay. A number of concepts in here that need discussion, but one of them is in the Septuagint. We don't see the word Bashan. Right. It is definitely in the Hebrew, mm -hmm. the Masoretic text. It is in there, mm -hmm. but apparently it was not in the Septuagint right. manuscript, or they would have put it in there. Mm -hmm. the, the, there could be several explanations for this. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that when the um, Septuagint translators rendered it, they didn't see the importance of Bashan. However, I see that as unlikely. Yeah, me too. Because it was during the period when they were translating the Septuagint that that uh, Greek language text was left in the temple on the summit of Mount Hermon. Everybody knew that Bashan was a place where the pagans would go, and it was a, essentially the entrance to the netherworld. Exactly. Even in, the, in the time of Josephus in the first century AD, he said that the uh, cave there, the Grotto of Pan, had not been plumbed. Nobody could let down a plumb line long enough to reach bottom. It was essentially a bottomless cave because it was the entrance to the underworld. Right. So, what, what verse is that? Verse 12. Thank you. I'm trying to look it up now. But if Change tabs. Sure. And the Net Bible says, the Net Bible renders it, again, based on the Masoretic. Many bulls surround me, powerful bulls of Bashan, hem me in. 
In the Sept in the uh, Hebrew, it is Ravim Parim. Hmm. That uh, word translated okay, Parim. Ravim is yeah. many mm -hmm. or multitudes of. Right. And Parim is. Oh. And the strong bulls is uh, Abir. And we did find that in uh, the DDD. The DDD. There's, there's another. Oh gosh, uh, I'm going to have to look this up because uh, the, the. Wait a minute. No, no, no. Wait. I'm thinking the Adarim, the noble ones, which yeah. is a, a reference to the underworld. Um, so, no, I'm confusing, confusing my Hebrew, mm -hmm. which doesn't take much because I don't read it or speak it. Uh, we relied upon Mike for that. <laughs> we, we did. No, we rely upon other tools, but uh, when, but, when yes. we were confused, we'd often go to him. But here's the thing. Um, in the word avir, or abir, mm -hmm. if you want to have the B sound, um, it is bulls, valiant, chiefest, or angels. Hmm. Well, I think in this case, that's, uh, that's the preferred translation. Mm-hmm. Make it's also used regarding princes and sacrificial objects. Hmm. I'm going to put a link in the in the notes to a paper that I've referred to multiple times because it really explains this. Dr. Robert D. Miller II, who's a professor at the Catholic University in Washington, D.C., wrote a paper some years ago, uh, fairly recently, within the last 20 years, titled The Bales of Bashan. Right. His point is that the typical explanation for the reference to the bulls of Bashan here, the fat beasts of Bashan in Ezekiel 39, and the cows of Bashan in Amos chapter 4, are typically explained away by Bible teachers as, oh yes, the cattle of Bashan were famous. Bashan was well known for its famous cattle, its well-fed cattle, and so on. That is not the case. And he went so far as to go into soil samples, agronomy to show that the soil composition of Bashan then and now was too poor to raise enough fodder for a cattle operation. Mm -hmm. You could, you know, goats, sheep, no problem. You could have... Goats fat, eat anything. Goats eat anything, sheep, fine. But when you've got large bovids, they would not thrive in Bashan. So his point was that these are not bovine, they are divine. Well, I... I appreciate everything he did, and anyone who wants to say that this is a, a real-world bovid of some kind, or a, 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 a bunch of them, that makes no sense either. Why, Why would, would there have been bulls around the cross? Exactly. Exactly. But he sees them, that's the point. Had there actually been bulls around the cross, it Every, would have been in the Bible. Everybody would have seen him. Oh, yeah, the gospel, they would have talked about all these bulls that were around there. Where'd they come from? Yeah. No, they yeah. were there in spirit, and right. these were entities. Correct. That's why I think Abishan may have been asked, added to clarify what it actually meant. Yeah. Yeah. Septuagint does not make that clear, um, stating that... Uh, no, it doesn't have 12. Bashan in there. Yeah. Young bulls encircled me, many fat bulls surrounded me. Mm -hmm. So by adding Bashan, the um, Masoretes, the Hebrews who, or the Hebrews, the Jewish scholars who completed the Hebrew text that we have, uh, th that our English Bibles are based on, kind of clarified what was going on here. And that was Dr. Miller's point. But I'm going to put a link to that PDF file because you can find it at Academia. And it's really eye opening. I mean, he, he just basically. He not only makes the point, he documents it so well that it should be a settled question. Mm -hmm. Never again think that there were famous cattle from Bashan. They, that just didn't exist. He's talking about these spirit beings from the realm of the, that was known to be the entrance to the netherworld. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Okay, here's the other thing to be discussed. We've got this imagery of bulls, and in fact, you get Young bulls in the Masoretic. Mm -hmm. This in the Septuagint is translated into English from that Greek as many bullocks have compassed me, surrounded me. Fat bulls have beset me around. Um, bullock is a young bull. So these are frisky, you know, 
scrappy, Mm -hmm. trying to make a name for themselves. The fat ones are the leaders, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think is interesting in that the word used in the Hebrew can also mean chief or prince. Mm -hmm. So I think we may have, and again, this is pure speculation, but drawn from what I see before me, that demons Mm -hmm. who are trying to make a name for themselves and either very strong demons, demon leaders who have climbed their way to the top or uh, fallen angels. Yes. Because the word also can be translated angels. Right. And I think you're absolutely right in that interpretation. So we, when we go and into- that would be the agreement of Dr. Miller in his paper. Well, thank you, Dr. Miller. Appreciate that. So when you go into 13 and it says, they have opened their mouth against me, reading from the Septuagint, as a ravening and roaring lion, we get the same imagery about Satan. Yes. I would argue that Satan was right there. Seeking whom he may devour. Yes. Right? This is not opening your mouths to yell at him. It's like opening your mouth to devour. Something. This is, I think, describing Satan and his assembly. Yes. Have surrounded. In other words, in the spirit, our Lord was taken into their assembly. Mm-hmm. I agree. And we, we will get into that, actually, in Psalm 68. Mm-hmm. It, it, there, there is a war over the land of Bashan. Mm-hmm. Assuming we get to Psalm 68 today. Well, we'll see. (laughs) Verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. You know, for the longest time, I just assumed, and of course I've been studying Bible, uh, the Bible and Bible prophecy for over 60 years. I am poured out like water. Mm -hmm. I was always assumed that was when his side was stabbed and Mm -hmm. water came out. Right. But this is a drink offering. Yes. He's reversing this idea. Right. And we get into this in Psalm 23. Yeah. And we also see it in 1 Corinthians 11 Mm -hmm. when Peter, or Paul rather, describes the Last Supper. Yes. This is my blood. Yes, exactly. I am poured out as a drink offering for humanity. Yes, exactly. And all my bones are out of joint, which is... What happens when you're hanging on the cross? Mm-hmm. Your bones eventually oh, dislocate absolutely. because of the weight of uh, uh, being suspended from your wrist joints. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. And this says, uh, and my belly has become like melting wax. This is a horrible way to die. Yes. And you remember Jesus' complaint on the cross, I thirst. Yes. But they gave him a yeah. sponge dipped in vinegar. Uh, my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. Now, hold on. Can you read 15 again? 15 again. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Thou hast brought me down to the dust of death. Hmm. Who's thou? Mm, well, we, uh, the, this is Septuagint I'm reading. Yeah. The uh, passage. Yeah, so the Lexham English Septuagint also has that same sense. You, I, I would you argue this is Yahweh who brought him down because right. he starts it out speaking to his father. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hand and feet. Mm-hmm. Now, this is interesting because it, it, the assembly of the the assembly. Of the wicked doers. That's what it says in the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. The assembly of the wicked doers. Okay. Yeah. Instead of a company. Yes. So the assembly of the wicked doers, is this a callback to Satan and his council? His infernal council? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. They pierced my hands and my feet. Mm Mm-hmm. The assembly of the wicked doers are the ones who pierced his hands and his feet. According to the... uh yeah, according to the, the ESV translator's notes, that is the, the, the Hebrew in some of the Hebrew manuscripts and also the Septuagint. Most Hebrew manuscripts read, like a lion, they are at my hands and feet. Hmm. The New English translators render it like a lion, they pin my hands and feet. And hmm. they've got a really long translator's note the reading is often emended, meaning modified or corrected, in air quotes, because it is grammatically awkward, but perhaps its awkwardness is by rhetorical design. 
But the idea that the hands and feet are pierced is again prophetic Absolutely. because of what happens at crucifixion. Because this was not done. They no. stoned you to death. Yes. Crucifixion was not invented until about 600 years after David. The Persians invented it sometime in the 4th century BC. So he would have had no, no knowledge of what crucifixion even was right. at this point. Which is why I said at the beginning. He being David. He being David. Which is why I yes, of course, yeah, God, Jesus. They, they, Spirit, they knew, they saw what was, yeah. what was going to come, and that's why they inspired David to write this. But um, that's, that's why I said at the beginning, it's unlikely that uh, the term uh, for the cross or at the beginning of uh, the Septuagint uh, chapter mm. w- would have been in the original because they would have had no knowledge of what a cross was. Um, verse uh, 17. 17. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, which of course happened at the crucifixion. Absolutely. Going back to verse 17, this seems to imply, and I've heard many, other, many scholars say this, that his bones weren't broken, not one of them. That's right. what, in other words, they're all intact. Mm-hmm. Which is important because in the Roman crucifixion, at the end, they broke your leg bone. They, right. they just slammed him. So you would die because you couldn't then rise up and try to get a breath. Right. Yeah. It was mainly because I'm tired of standing here. Die. Because sometimes they would intentionally leave them there for days. Right. Right. And they wanted to get them down before the holiday because the Jews well, would the not Jews do anything. Did. The Jews yeah. did. Yeah. And so they were surprised when Jesus died much sooner than expected. Yes. Verse 19. But you, O Yahweh, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Just one other observation here. They say, the skeptics do. Skeptics will often say that Jesus understood the prophecies of the Old Testament and he manipulated his life in his final days to fulfill all of those prophecies. Why would you How, do that? Well, for one thing, why would you do that unless you're insane? And there's no evidence from any of the writings of the eyewitnesses that Jesus was, was that he was. And secondly, how could you manipulate the Roman soldiers to cast lots for his cloak? Right. You couldn't. You couldn't. So skeptics, sorry, it just doesn't work. Verse 19, but you, O Yahweh, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Okay, I'll stop. Deliver my soul from the sword. Hmm. Okay. That, I confess, that's a verse I just sort of take sort of as given. It says the same exact thing in the Septuagint. Mm-hmm. Deliver my soul from the sword. Yeah. My only one. Net Bible translators. My only begotten one from the power of the dog. Yeah. Yeah. Net Bible translates it, deliver me from the sword instead mm-hmm. of deliver my soul. So but why the sword? Um. David realizing he was going to be a man of war, having to fight Philistines. Oh, I realize yeah. that. It's just that doesn't quite fit the crucifixion. And I guess that's a reminder that you can't find a word for word correlation. Not every verse in the Old Testament will describe events in the New. Mm-hmm. And even when you find passages that have large chunks that do refer to the new it doesn't mean that everything in there will deliver my soul from the sword deliver my soul Mm -hmm. we know that jesus he himself went down and mike uh, heiser talked about this a lot Mm -hmm. went down to preach to the ones in tartarus hey guess what Mm -hmm. you don't get to be resurrected even though you asked for it begged for it pleaded for it threatened Mm -hmm. you're not doing it yeah but i'm getting out of here right you're still dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the word is uh, nefesh. Mm. So, so um, t- sometimes translated life, but often translated as soul. Mm. So deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. And again, I'm not sure we're dealing with, I, I think we may be dealing with I think supernatural, this is supernatural stuff, yeah. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. and. Or you have answered me. The wild oxen is re'emim, which is a 
term applied to the giant cattle that used to roam Asia and Europe, the, yeah. the aurochs, um, often worshipped in their own right. But uh, I think that that contributed to the uh, the the worship of or the bull like imagery of so many of the ancient gods. Gods of Mesopotamia. I think you are absolutely right. In the Septuagint, strangely enough, it says, and regard my lowliness from the horns of the unicorns. Ah, okay. Now, unicorns never existed in in the way that they're drawn in cartoons. It could be that there's a spirit entity that is a one-horned entity. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, rhinoceros. Well, no, I'm sorry, been, that's not, not an entity. Lamont. That's yeah. a that's an animal. Right, right, right. I'm talking spirit being, mm-hmm. um, and perhaps there are that have one eye or one horn or whatever, maybe demons. But uh, um, horns represent power. Mm-hmm. Horns are all almost always added to fallen angels. So I think that this refers back to bulls of Bashan. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Verse 22. This, this one is cited in Hebrews chapter 2. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. I know. I love that. Yeah. That's the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You who fear Yahweh, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Okay, this is a reference back to the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He hasn't. Yeah. Even in your deepest despair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he goes to praise those Mm -hmm. who love him. And saying, I will tell of your name uh, to my brothers in the midst of the the congregation. And uh, that, that citation of this in Hebrews 2 is really... Amazing. You get it again in 25. Yeah. Verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise Yahweh. May your hearts live forever. The tone of this psalm is just done a 180 yes all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to yahweh and all the families of the nation shall worship before you still prophetic Mm -hmm. for kingship belongs to yahweh and he rules over the nations gotta stop there for a minute because there is a tradition in antiquity in pagan religions sumerian mesopotamian Mm -hmm. you can name it egyptian that kingship is given through a certain deity who's mm-hmm. ever whoever is top of the pantheon right is the one who who uh, uh defers and confers sorry kingship mm-hmm. in mesopotamia it was actually the, the term actually literally means enlil ship ah enlil or el of the canaanites dagon molech that same entity different names was believed to be the one who conveyed kingship upon human rulers Interestingly, in a paper on the history of Enlil that I read as research for the book, The Second Coming of Saturn, again, another name for this entity, it was originally Inanna who conveyed yes. kingship. Yes. She conveyed kingship. Yes. And she also conveyed the mez, which was how to operate in society. Right. All of the various uh, uh, secrets. Mm-hmm. A Prometheus sort of right, right. position. And, and, and this is why we think there's some politics going on in the fallen realm because as the worship of Enlil or El was brought into Sumer from the north by the Akkadians and the Amorites, this changed. It was no longer Inanna who conveyed kingship. It became Enlil ship. Mm-hmm. Like, but he's in the abyss because we think he was Shemiyaza, the leader of the sons of God from Genesis six. And yet he still apparently has enough influence with human dupes that uh, he's still influencing the world to this day. Um, but Inanna, when Revelation comes, she thinks she'll ride the beast and uh, tame it. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Politics of the fallen realm. 
Uh, but uh, here again, in verse 28 of Psalm 22, kingship belongs to Yahweh, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. In the Septuagint, it says, all the fat ones of the earth have eaten and worshipped, all that go down to the earth. Mm -hmm. Not dust. Oh, okay. So is the word mm -hmm. translated dust, Eretz? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, no, it's a par. Okay, then this is different. Because they, they is, chose go down to the earth. Mm -hmm. But it is a word that uh, refers to the world of the dead. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting because now you've got in this psalm a reference to the dead worshiping and bowing and praising Yahweh, mm -hmm. which uh, you've got uh, one of the psalms that say the, uh, the dead do not praise Yahweh. Do the dead rise up to, you know. Shall the dead rise up and praise thee? Yeah. Right, yeah. Hmm. That's in Elijah. Ah. <laughs> the widow woman mm -hmm. who is, uh, you know, Elijah has implied that he can raise her son from the dead. Mendelssohn chose to quote that in her song. Interesting. Interesting. This seems to suggest a, a bit of a, trans, a, a transition or a change in the way the world of the, uh, the dead was viewed by the ancient Israelites. Mm -hmm. It implies a resurrection. Yes, it does. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him, before God, shall bow all who go down to the dust, the realm of the dead, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Here's another interesting thing about verse 29, is that it, uh, it echoes the uh, poem or the tradition of El summoning everyone to a banquet. The Rephaim. Yes. Mm-hmm resurrecting them and then bringing them to a banquet. Instead, the Lord resurrects us uh -huh. and takes us to a banquet. Yes. Total reversal. Yes, mm -hmm. I know. I love it. Mm. Verse 30, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. And here, this is uh, Lord Adonai. Uh, they shall come and proclaim his righteous, righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. How wonderful. Do we have time for Psalm 23? We do. We, I think we may only get through two of the Psalms today instead of the four that we had on the schedule, oh, which is yeah. fine because Psalm 68 is going to take a lot of time to unpack. So uh, we'll just have to... Psalm 23, it's one we memorized. Most of oh, you yeah. have memorized it. I did when I was a kid. In fact, I would often quote it and sing Jesus Love Me mm -hmm. because I was raised, part of my childhood, I was raised on a farm. And, um, well, even when we moved to town... And by town, I mean, a, you know, a town of 300 people. It was a farm town. Even when we actually moved to town, I uh, still had to go to a, an outdoor facility <laughs> for the years. The kind with the little moon on the door? Oh, yeah. For years. Mm -hmm. And so when I would go out in the middle of the night mm -hmm. with my little flashlight, I would sing Jesus Loves Me, and I would quote the 23rd Psalm. Mm. It really comforted me when I was a little kid. So, yes, you probably memorized it, but let me read it for you. Yahweh, Yahweh is my shepherd. Yahweh mm -hmm. is my shepherd. Now, yes. mind you, this follows in the order in which someone said, let's put him in this order. Mm -hmm. Follows 23. He's now resurrected. Right, right. He's leading us through events in a, a, a deliberate message to the fallen realm. The Lord is my shepherd. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want, which means you don't lack for anything. Mm -hmm. He makes me lie down in green pastures, which is very pleasant. Who doesn't love that? Not, it's soft. It's comfortable. Sunshine on my, my, my skin. And, and I get lots of great food to eat. He leads me beside still waters. Oh, the nice, cool clear water he restores my soul resurrection mm -hmm. and payment for our sins he restores our soul he yes. brought us back he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake now mind you this says yahweh is my shepherd Jesus called himself the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he was taking on the position of the Psalm 23 shepherd and equating himself 
with Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Just in case you missed it. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Hashem. Yes, and this is where we get into, uh, again, the, the name theology. Mm-hmm. Mike uh, Heiser, and we will often refer to Mike. Mike we was sort do. of our Almost go-to every theological listen. guy. Yeah. If you listen to our older studies, we kind we of. Go, ding, ding, ding. Yeah, if we ring a bell every time we mention Mike. <laughs> and finally, somebody said, you know, we, we appreciate that, but it can be a little distracting. So we stopped doing it. But just know that uh, almost Some every, of you miss it. I've heard from you saying, that's I miss true. the ding ding. So we go ding at home. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, he, he has often taught about the name and name theology. It's more than God's reputation. It's another physical aspect of God. The when, second power in heaven. Second power in heaven. When uh, the angel of Yahweh led the Israelites out of Egypt, God told Moses, follow him because my name is in him. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other references. I'll see. There was a reference to name theology that I stumbled across today. And, and in fact, Mike wrote the uh, the extended treatment of name theology for the uh, the Faith Life Study Bible, if you want to dig into it. And I'm not going to be able to re- call it to mind and do Mike justice in his uh, explanation of it. But essentially, it is... W- when people say you are saved by calling on the name of Jesus Christ, it's not that the name of Jesus is a like a magic word. No, no. You are actually calling on an aspect, a manifestation of the Godhead itself. Exactly. The name is God in one of his forms. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about here. And the Canaanites understood this too. That Rephaim text that you referenced where the uh, Rephaim were summoned to the threshing floor of El, which is the The summit of Mount Hermon, the portal. And then the the Rephaim text, I think it's KTU 1.22, if you want to look it up in the scholarly literature, literally says where they, the heroes, the Rephaim, will be revivified by the blessing of the name of El. So it was a concept familiar to the pagans. Mm-hmm. And stolen by the fallen stolen realm. Stolen by the pagans. Stolen by the fallen realm. So He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I'll stop here in a second. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Boy, an entire hour could go uh, valley of the shadow of death. Well, in fact, I have done an entire hour. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. The uh, recently com- concluded um, Skywatch TV Defender virtual conference, I did a, an hour on the valley of the shadow of death. That was the one from last year? The one, or the one from this September, year? The one in the fall. From last fall. Right. Um, Matthew four, beginning at verse 12 writes, and let me see if I can switch. Well, okay. Went to blue letter Bible and it brings up the Berean study Bible. So this is a slightly different blue translation. Letter does? Yeah. Bible hub automatically. Or Bible does. hub. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's Bible hub. It defaults to Berean. Yeah. I like Berean. It's really, I like it a lot. It, it is a good translation. Uh, but if it's a little different and you're following in the ESV, this is why, uh, Matthew four, beginning at verse 12, when Jesus heard that John had been imprisoned, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived at Capernaum. That's about 26 miles distant, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And now Matthew goes to quote Isaiah chapter nine, which is that same chapter that includes unto us, a son is born unto us, a child is given Mm -hmm. the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. That's a reference to the Roman road, the Via Maris Mm -hmm. that ran from Egypt up along the Mediterranean, and then it cut it through the Jezreel Valley over to the Jordan, up alongside the Sea of Galilee, up the Jordan Valley, through the valley called the Hula Valley, mm-hmm. H-U-L-E-H. Um, and then at the site of the ancient city of Hatsor, then it would branch off on the road that went to Damascus. That's the way of the sea, the Via Maris. Beyond the Jordan, that's east of the Jordan River. So that's smack dab in the middle of the land of Bashan. Mm -hmm. Psalm 23 doesn't mention Bashan specifically, but 
we understand that that's what it means because as Matthew continues, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. He calls us Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, actually, so does Isaiah. The people d- living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So Jesus moving to that region identifies this region as the land of the shadow of death. Yes. And that valley that the Jordan goes through between Dan at the foot of Mount Hermon and um, Chorazin, which mm-hmm. is just north of uh, Capernaum, surrounded by dolmens. Oh, Israeli archaeologists have just really recently s- surveyed this area and found more than 5,000 dolmens. These are these megalithic funerary monuments all around the outside of this valley. And the guy who led the survey, whose name is Moshe Hartal, said or wrote, we can't use the term dolmen fields anymore because we don't know where one ends and the next one begins. It's, it's one giant dolmen field. Mm, it's a big necropolis. It's the valley of the shadow of death. Yes, yes. Um, and that's where he leads us. And that's where he ministered. And Now bear in mind these dolmens, because this will become really important in just a second. I know. The dolmens, for the most part in that area, are a, a trilithon construction. Two big vertical slabs and then a mm-hmm. tabletop slab across the top. Dolmen is Britonic for table. Right. So they are table shaped. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In other words, no matter what happens to me while I'm there, fallen realm, talk to the shepherd. Yes. He's got these implements that are used upon you. He's there to protect me. And the rod. They're also symbols of kingship. Yes. My king is with me. We are these little sheep Mm -hmm. who are in this valley. Like the Hula Valley was very lush, very green, because they had a lot of water there. The Jordan River there, they used to call it the Hula Marsh. The Israelis drained it in the 1950s. But it's still, to this day, a very fertile valley like the Jezreel, Mm -hmm. like the American Midwest. It's green everywhere. Farmland, they've got a nature reserve there where birds flying from Africa on their way to Europe will stop there. It's a green, lush, well-watered area. And we're the little sheep who are wandering around, surrounded by these monuments to the dead, the region of Bashan. Think of every one of those of monuments as a portal, as a doorway for something to come through. So you're surrounded by these evil entities. And clueless as we usually are as humans to what's going on in the spirit realm. We're just going about our business. Eating hey, this grass. is grass. Oh, yeah. this is wonderful. That's great. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's frolic. Let's play. And you can do that. You can relax because... He's with us. The shepherd is right exactly. behind us with his rod and his staff. And here we go. You prepare a table <laughs> before me in the presence of my enemies. Not only does he build a table, think of he's creating a dolmen in my honor, in your honor. He anoints my head with oil. Anointing. That is an anointing. That means that. The spirit becomes part of your life and you are anointed as a sovereign, as a ruler, as a prince or princess. Um, King Charles of England is going to be uh, formally crowned in May. And when that happens, part of that ceremony is he will be anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it is traditionally done in a very private way. They cover you up so that this very sacred moment when kingship is conferred to you Mm -hmm. through the anointing that you become a different person on the other side as if you passed through a portal from mortal to king Mm. with God anointing you. Now we have table prepared, a dolmen prepared Mm -hmm. here around all, all these other dolmens and you anoint my head, you confer royalty upon me Mm -hmm. amongst all of these elder brothers who have fallen and these demons, their children who have chosen to leave all of that behind. He is saying, not only do I love the children of Adam and Eve, but I want them as part of my council. They're taking your vacant chairs. And he did this after enduring the mockery of the dogs 
the lions, yes. the bulls of Bashan on the cross. Yes. Now he is taking us right into their territory and saying, look, for generations, for thousands of years, they've been preparing these big stone tables as mm-hmm. altars for their pagan rituals. I'm preparing a table for you as they watch mm-hmm. and then anointing you as they watch. As they watch. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now, here's another one that could last for half an hour or more, (laughs) because there was a ritual in the uh, antiquity, and I bet it's still done today, that required the son of the cup, usually the physical first son Mm -hmm. of an individual who dies, to fill that cup with an offering libation and pour it out on a regular basis. And summon the ancestors by name to this ritual meal where they're little teraphim, the statues mm-hmm. representing the deceased ancestors were given bread, smear the bread on the statue to feed uh-huh. it, and then pour out the drink offering to give them sustenance in the afterlife. That had to be done again and again right. and again. This one overflows. Christ died for all once and yes, done. Exactly. And yes, that ritual does continue to this day as we see the cult of the ancestors all over the world it it is we can trace it all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia yes. and to the uh, the fallen realm and the rebellion on Mount Hermon. And it goes back to Psalm twenty two when yep. he says, "I am poured out like water." Yes, he is filling our cup with he has his reversed blood. It. There are st- one and done statues in the ancient world of kings from ancient Syria, Amorite kings, sitting in their little tombs, representing them with with a cup in one hand. Mm-hmm. And the offerings, and for kings, you had to do this ritual twice a month because their spirits, I guess, needed more sustenance. You had They're to keep really them happy. Hungry. Yeah. And there are remnants of food offerings in these tombs that have been found, but those cups were there for the drink offering. Instead of pouring it on the ground, you pour it in a little cup. But here in this psalm, in the presence uh-huh. of these spirits, Jesus yes. is filling our cup to the point of overflowing. And at the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, reversing that. Look. Here's my blood given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Yes. Here's my body given for you. Every time you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. And it's, it's not wrote, that we're literally filling it with no, his blood no. again. This is just a remembering what he did. Yes, we, we remember the Lord's death. We celebrate it until he comes. And it shows the fallen realm again. And I say, children memorize this because every time they say it, the fallen realm are reminded yes. of how much we mean to our Lord and King. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, which, by the way, is eternal. <laughs> and I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh, the Beit Yahweh, yes. forever. <laughs> I will get to be there. I'm going to be part of the council because I am now part of the royal family. And you Guys, out here in the valley of the shadow of death, you're still dead. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? It is. Can you see why I get so excited about these psalms? When I, I have to, you know, tell listeners when you gave this presentation on the twenty third psalm at that conference a couple of years ago in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and you explained the significance of preparing a table in the valley of the shadow of death. 300 people there in the audience, and you just hear just this massive intake of breath as they saw the picture before them. (gasps) Because suddenly now this psalm took on a whole new level of meaning. Doesn't it, though? Oh, and that's that's the amazing thing about God's Word. And I love the psalms. I've been just over the last few years, I've been really digging into them Mm -hmm. because there's a lot there, and many of them are short, and your kids can memorize them. Yes, yes. And the, you can even memorize them. So this, this even me, <laughs> even oh, me, age, age. my age. Oh, oh, wow! Might need some more supplements from Eden's Essentials. To... <laughs> no, th- this is really phenomenal. And this is one of the reasons we're going to Israel early because on the day that uh, Aaron Lipkin is calling Jeep Day, where we go to these mm-hmm. sites that are not touristy sites, one of the places we really want to see is. Besides Gilgal Rephaim, we plan to go there. We plan to go to the Serpent Mound of Bashan. I want to go to the Shamir Kibbutz, where they've got the uh, the dolmens there, including that massive dolmen with the fifty ton capstone. Oh yeah, that's huge because, because it's got IU underneath. It, it does. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like the Indiana University it's logo. The, it's the Greek sign Psi. Yeah, but uh, the, you have to wonder why that is there. <laughs> we'll be there on Thursday. It'll be Psi Thursday. Ah, uh, but 
Pretty that funny, honey. site, yeah. according to the archaeologist who wrote that paper on the dolmens of the Hula Valley, appears to have been the center of the culture that built all of those dolmens. So we can go there and record this teaching next to that 50-ton capstone and explain mm. this is the heart of the culture that built these dolmens. This is what David was moved to write 3,000 years ago. And now, thanks to the work of the archaeologists, who many, many of whom don't read <clears throat> the stones with the biblical worldview, but we, with that blessing, the Word of God helping us to interpret this, we can see what Jesus was talking about and how literally he took this. Because we'll be standing on one of the hills overlooking that valley, that Hula Valley, ringed by dolmens, leading down to the Sea of Galilee, where he stood stilled the waters mm -hmm. that whole region is so supernaturally charged which would have been known to the ancient hebrews i mean the, the prophets and the apostles knew all of this we've lost that historical context and we are just so excited about being able to go back there and say this is why this is why we travel here and we want to show this to you now, sadly, our tour won't be going to that Shamir Dolman field, but if we can get this on video and then share that with you. I think it'll be monumental. Man. I really do. By the way, as you sort of ring around, there, there's a road that takes you around the Hula Valley as we're approaching various sites that we visit in these tours. And, and you can see dolmens <laughs> as you're driving past. Oh, there's one. They're all over the place. Uh -huh. All over the place. In fact, we didn't even recognize it while we were in the central court, Gilgal Rephaim. That's a dolmen. The is threshold it, yes. stone is a dolmen. It's a dolmen. They're often covered over mm -hmm. like a big cairn over top of it. Right. Yeah. Um, we've talked with L.A. Marzulli about that a number of times. If you, by the way, if you love the idea of going to Israel and you simply couldn't go this spring because your schedule didn't permit it, L.A. is taking a tour this fall. Yep. Prophecy Watchers will be there just about the same time we are. I know that. Um, well, it's too late to get in on that, but I'm yes, talking about this but fall. If you want to go, there in the you fall. go this right. year, I think it's October. Mm -hmm. And we're going back next March. Yeah, late March and early April. I think the tour will start right around the 30th of March next year. We'll, we'll announce those specific dates in just a few weeks. And we're also waiting for absolute guest. confirmation from the special guest. And trust mm -hmm. me, you're going to want to go. We are, um, yeah, no, yeah. So many things want to share, but we can't uh, jump the gun on it. Oh, but, uh, no, we won't. We won't. Definitely, as, as long as the Lord keeps us healthy enough to go, mm -hmm. we, we will go. But every time we go, we want to bring back videos so that if you're not able physically or financially, because we understand it's not cheap, No, but we want to share it with you. We've um, parsed out, <clears throat> and you can find all of these videos on our app, by the way. There's some like 35 little clips that are like three to five minutes long. Um, it's more or less the bulk of our 2018 and 2019 tours, the sites that we visited. We also have those uh, videos available. If you just want to watch the tour video, you can watch it for, I think, a seven-day rental for like three bucks at our streaming video site, which we keep forgetting to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, GilbertHouse.org slash video. We've got a bunch of video teachings there, including our two travelogue documentaries of our Israel tours. And... Um, those will give you a look at what it's like. If you're curious, what is it like? Is it safe? Do people have fun? Is it uh, grueling physically? We, we show you what we went through on, on both of those tours, including the long walk to Joshua's altar. Mm -hmm. So worth it. It is so worth it. And by the way, if you're watching the news and you're thinking, oh my God, uh, my, my, my goodness, I can't go over there because the, the, the Western press keep talking about all these terrible things happening. They were saying that while we were there in 2018 and when we were there in 2019, and it's just, it's safer than walking down most city streets. Yeah, here in the U.S.? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm from Chicago. I'd rather go to Israel than Chicago. <laughs> Lived in St. Louis for years. I'd rather go to Israel than St. Louis right now. And the food is cleaner mm -hmm. over there. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. You're so going to love that food. I can't wait. My body's already going... Can we just, because we, you and I eat pretty clean. We do. But it's but, even cleaner over there. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, if you live in Chicago or St. Louis, I'm not trying to besmirch either city. I know that it's not the people who live there. Our daughter still lives in St. Louis. and I do go there to visit her. It's the her. government. It's the government. Yeah. But it, you know, that's the case pretty much everywhere. I really so. enjoyed living in Illinois, but I, unless the Lord led us back there and said, this is where I want you now, I, I wouldn't be inclined to go back there because of the, the way the government is run for yeah. the state. 
because it's controlled by Chicago. Oh, yeah, I know. The and whole state. The tail you, wags that dog. Uh-huh. Having grown up in Chicago and not really understanding when you're a kid that things happen in, in Illinois outside of Cook County. Mm. You know, sometimes Will or McHenry or Lake County. You know, the Collar Counties. Downstate is everything outside of Chicago. But we lived for four years down um, south of Champaign and realized, oh, this is why the southern part of the state really... Uh, because Chicago, the people who live in Chicago really don't have a clue mm-hmm. as to what goes on the rest of the state. Farming, coal, oil, really big in the southern part well, of the state. Well, here's an example. We live just an example of the money you pay to live, have the honor of living in the state of Illinois. Mm-hmm. We live on 10 acres. Mm-hmm. We didn't set out to buy find 10 acres. We no. would have been happy with just a lot, but, you know, a regular subdivision City lot. lot, yep. But uh, the Lord led us to this house. It's a very simple manufactured home, but it's got this barn. And I think that's why we're here. I think you're right. That is why we're here. And he may do something else with the acreage eventually. I don't know. But we pay, what is it, $600 a year? It's about about $725 now. It's going up a little bit. But that's that's still like- In property taxes. 20% of what we were paying in In Illinois. In property taxes. Well, I looked at some simple, low, first-time buyer homes out of curiosity in the town where we live, Charleston, Charleston, Illinois, mm-hmm. and the taxes on some of those houses were five hundred, six hundred dollars a, a month. month. Yeah. A month mm-hmm. on top of your mortgage. Mortgage insurance, right. your house insurance, and your payment. And interest rates have gone up now. I don't know how a young family in some states can afford a house. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh, now we've gotten into a PID radio. We have, haven't we? <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is, we can transition this into a discussion what we uh, of what we brought up early on the Build Barn Better mm-hmm. project, which is taking a a playful tweak on the World Economic Forum's Build Back Better. Well, that's the cool slogan. thing, though. The barn is there, and it's a great mm-hmm. uh, sort of well established bones yeah. for what uh, the Lord is telling us He wants to build there, and. And it's it may be more than shipping and studio space. I think it's going to be there for doing presentations and perhaps Bible studies, maybe even yeah. preaching. Yeah. We we will go where he leads. Mm-hmm. It's just a simple 30 by 40 foot rectangle. So 1,200 square feet. It just needs to be insulated. We need to run power the rest of the way around the building, run a separate circuit for the, uh, the mm-hmm. mini split so we can get heating and cooling in there. Put in new windows. And actually, someone has already told us that he would supply the windows. Which is just... I know. Stunning. We're, we're just absolutely stunned by that. So, yeah, just a few things. And if the Lord leads to do more beyond that, then we will do it because we know he's going to provide mm-hmm. the funds for it. Based on the estimates we've gotten, we're assuming, we, we're figuring this is going to run about $15,000. It and may then, be more than maybe that Maybe a little now. more than I'm that. I'm thinking it may be closer to 25000 But whatever it turns out to be, we know the Lord, Lord is going to supply it. He's made that obvious already. Mm-hmm. So, uh You'll find a a red button says donate on the right hand column at Mm -hmm. uh, gilberthouse.org or gilberthouse.org slash donate if you want to go right there. And um, we truly appreciate your support and your help because we we just feel that we need to do more to make these studies and this information available. I mean, it's it's one thing to write books and, and, enjoy the research and the, and the, and the writing. And we do, but, but not everybody is going to, want to pick up a 300 page book with 550 footnotes. Mm -hmm. Um, So if we can set up a facility where we can start making short form videos, just address one question at a time Mm -hmm. and put those out through various social media channels, as long as we're, you know, as we're, we're, until we get canceled, which may or may not happen someday, who knows, but we've got our free app, which uh, free to you. And and again, it's through your support that we afford the monthly, Mm -hmm. uh, the monthly cost, the company that provides it and, and develops it, their their rates are really very affordable, which yeah. is why so many ministry friends are using it. Skywatch TV uses it. Prophecy Watchers uses it. L.A. Marzulli, Doug Hamp, uh, you know, and so yeah. on. Many, many of our friends are using it's that same It's their company. ministry to the body of Christ. It really is. So we are blessed by them. And if we can use that to transmit this information, then that's what we're going to do. But um, right now we're just a little constrained. We're sitting in it, as we've said before, sitting in a back bedroom our shipping office is in the next bedroom mm-hmm. over. My podcast studio is in the other bedroom over here. And um, if we can have a little more space where we can set up uh, a little more flexibility for recording content, that's what we want to do. Yeah. So again, we're not a 501c3, but if right. you feel led 
to help out. And it can be any amount. If you've got, you know, 50 cents. what? Because it all adds up. Mm-hmm. It really all adds up. And sometimes that 50 cents is like the widow's might. It is a large chunk for you. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a student at Indiana University, I had $10 a week to live on, if that. And so I was very, very careful with my money. Because sometimes that money would have to go towards like a bus ticket or things like that. So it went fast. And I didn't have a whole lot of really nutritious food, mm. macaroni and cheese and ramen noodles. <laughs> and I would occasionally occasionally splurge on a pizza that would last me five days. And yes, I can tell you that students leave it out on the counter and eat on it for five days. Yeah, it stays good until you're done eating it. That's, That's really the law it of works. pizza. It's, it's a law. Yeah. I, when I was in college, I lived on uh, ramen noodles and uh, Bisquick biscuits. Yep. Yep. I, I've done that. I've yeah. done that peanut butter sometimes, peanut butter, but yeah. peanut butter can get pricey. Mm-hmm. However, back in the day, I could get 10 boxes of macaroni and cheese for $1. Yeah. I went for the 10 ramen noodle uh-huh. things for a buck. See, if you've yeah. got $10, that's a hundred meals. Yeah. That's three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but yeah, it, it, we really, really appreciate it. And, um, Trying to think if there's one more. Oh, tonight on VFTB. Tonight on A View from the Bunker. Um, That's a special the guys, one. Yeah, the guys from the Iron and Myth series that we've been recording. That's uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, Dr. Jed Burton, Brian Kadawa. We uh, just remember Mike Heiser. So this is sort of our tribute. We talk about when we first became familiar with his work, how his work influenced us, and uh, what we do. Um. You know, all of us, essentially, in that uh, group, all four of us, agree that Mike's work transformed our, our lives. Judd, as an archaeologist and a historian, um, has uh, basically said he'd still be teaching in, in academia instead of doing what he's doing now, which was essentially setting up his own educational institution, the Institute of Biblical Anthropology, where he not only teaches things like why the giants were important, you can actually study monsterology, (laughs) vampires and werewolves from a biblical perspective. Uh, Brian Godawa, award-winning Hollywood screenwriter, novelist, best-selling author. Mike's research informs Brian's fiction. He writes fiction as you do with the Divine Council Mm -hmm. worldview in place. Pastor Doug Van Dorn, one of the few pastors in America who will actually teach and spend time on Genesis 6 and why it's important. And, um, I'd still be selling steel, probably, if... Uh, if the it, Lord hadn't called you. Yeah, and understanding the divine counsel concept, it was like, wow, okay, this is really important, and uh, I want to know more about this. And the way he created me, I was talking to my mom about this last night, as I talked to her every night, it's just telling her, Mom, you know, your school teacher's heart, because she was sharing with me a story from 60 years ago, one room schoolhouse. One room schoolhouse where she taught in 65 years ago, really, in uh, North Dakota. Um, she, she remembers those days more clearly now than she does things that have happened recently. That's how, when you get older, the distant past is just as clear as anything. Whether or not and, you're remembering it correctly, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But her, uh, her memories are um, pleasant ones. Yes. And, praise the Lord. Uh, ma- many of them are, are pleasant ones. And she remembered a, was remembering a Christmas where her, her dad, my, my German grandfather with the deep voice, played Santa Claus. And how a little boy who was not from a happy family, sadly, um, she gave him the special job of opening the door for Santa Claus. And so for little Freddie, first grade, opens the door and there's Santa standing at the door and he was, <gasps> and for mom, that was a wonderful memory. And I was able, you know, it, it dawned on me. I said, you know, mom. I think I inherited this love of teaching from you because you took extra time in working with this little boy whose parents, according to her, had said that, well, you can't teach him anything. That's why he's been held back. He's dumb. Well, when your parents are telling you that, you sort of live down to those expectations. Mom got him reading by the end of that that school year. And for her, that that is a warm, pleasant memory. And then... You know, just Holy Spirit kind of nudging my ear said, you know, honor your mother here. Yes. It's like, mom, it's the love of reading that you taught me, the love of learning and the love of teaching. 
that's led to doing what we do now. So well, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for our parents. And uh, thank you for listening and for uh, paying attention to what we do here. And uh, well, Father, we thank you for this community that you have created around us. I don't know how it happened because we certainly didn't send out, set out to make this a thing. If, if we had known that this was the destination, I would have messed it up at some point. I would have aimed for it and I would have messed it up. But this has grown organically around us. And uh, Father, we are just humbled. I am humbled each day as I think of the way that these humble efforts from a back bedroom go out into the world and the notes, the emails that we receive. Lord, you deserve all that praise and all that credit because it's not. It's not me. You have blessed me beyond measure with my wife, my family. And there are days when I allow the little foxes nipping at my heels to distract me and, and lead to frustration and anger. And I ask your forgiveness for those times. Lord, I just pray for your spirit to grant me the wisdom and the passion to preach and to teach your word, only that which you would have us speak. You've entrusted so much to us. And in my flesh, I deserve none of this. So, Father, in all that we do, in all that I do, Father, I pray for your Spirit to guide, guide me, setting aside my own petty concerns to see the big picture to view the world as you see it, to care for your sheep as you lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. We thank you for having brought wiser brothers across our path, like Dr. Michael Heiser, Tom Horn, L.A. Marzulli, Steve Quayle, so many others from whom we have learned for opening your word to us to what little understanding we have. The length to which you've gone to redeem us, to buy us back from the powers of darkness, is inspiring. For we know, Lord, that whatever we encounter in this world, when the strong bulls of Bashan surround us, we know that you have experienced it first that you know what we face and that you are right there behind us with your rod and your staff. We pray, Father, for your blessing, for your love to guide us, to fill us, and inspire us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.